This is NFA Talk, the show that talks about guns and gun rights, keeping you up to date with what's currently going on, from the newest guns, promotions, and events, plus how we're lobbying for your rights. Hi, welcome to another episode of NFA Talk. I'm Jordan Vandenhoff. Joining me, I have Rick Igersidge, our president of Canada's National Farms Association, Charles Zach, our man in Ottawa, and joining us, our special guest, Roman Baber. Roman will be running for the CPC leadership that's, uh, that's going to be happening in September. Roman, thank you so much for joining us. Good to be with you. Hello, Roman. Uh, on behalf of Canada's National Firearms Association, uh, a big welcome. Uh, we're here today to give you uh, the floor, basically an open forum uh, to uh, discuss with us uh, what some of your positions are in firearms and also uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, the other aspects of your campaign. So feel free to go at will. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. So my name is Roman Baber, and um, some of your viewers may know I'm a former uh, member of provincial parliament for the District of York Centre, which is in North Toronto. And about two years ago, I made a choice that I wasn't going to watch my former government uh, impose harm on Canadians anymore uh, by way of what I believe to be overreaching and very harmful lockdowns. I wrote a letter to Premier Ford asking for a balanced response that would factor in the collateral harm of lockdowns into our public health response. Uh, I guess the government didn't take to that too kindly and I was removed from caucus, lost my uh, position as chair of the Justice Committee but uh, that didn't stop me from continuing to advocate for Canadians and, and fight for democratic rights and freedoms uh, against uh, lockdowns, against passports, against mandates for our democracy, for our children. And uh, I invite your viewers and in fact, all Conservative Party members to campaign with me and work with me until every single Canadian has every single one of their democratic rights fully restored. And that's primarily why I'm in this race. I have a unique perspective on democracy. Um, I was born and lived in the former Soviet Union until I was almost nine. We didn't gain our freedom until the whole thing collapsed in 1989 under the weight of its own lies. Um, and that's why I have a unique perspective on how precious democracy is and how fragile it is. And I'm very concerned with what I'm seeing vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, erosion of Canadian democracy. First, I'm uh, personally offended at the fact that we still treat close to 20% of Canadians as second-class citizens. Um, I'm, I made the choice that most Canadians made uh, by way of vaccination, but that was my choice. And for the record, we still agree that it's still a choice. And I, I think that the fact that we impose mobility uh, limits on Canadians is, is something that is to be expected uh, of a regime that is not democratic. Mobility rights are not just charter rights, they're human rights. And, and to know that still uh, a good percentage of Canadians must be detained at home after they travel abroad or are still potentially not able to visit their loved ones at a hospital um, is, is, is something that uh, I oppose adamantly. And the fact that there are some Canadians that were landlocked believing that their rights are being eroded it must have created fear in their hearts. And the fact that any Canadian would fear their federal government is reason enough to get rid of Justin Trudeau. Same with mandates. I think that workplace mandates um, are inhumane. It's, I, I think it's inhumane to make someone choose between their ability to put food on the table and their personal health care choice. That's why I brought legislation in Ontario to uh, protect workers against workplace mandates. But regretfully, it was uh, voted down on second reading. I will... Uh, as Prime Minister, pass legislation banning all passports and mandates. I will also freeze funding to any province that allows for private sector mandates or within its provincially regulated industries like colleges and universities and hospitals. I'm going to put an end to this 21st century discrimination and segregation that is not based in science. I think it's a shameful episode in our nation's history. Uh, and I'm determined on protecting the democratic rights of all Canadians. The most important thing we can do to restore our democracy is to restore our freedom of speech, which is also being eroded. Um, we're seeing a number of bills making their way through Parliament, uh, abridging our, our basic right to free speech. And I don't understand that because we have the right to be wrong. And good 
uh, speech and, and free speech is, is not just good for public policy, uh, for democracy, it's also good for public policy because through uh, entertaining more opinion, um, you would um, arrive at better decision-making. I, um, I'm very, very afraid that government bureaucrats will now be able to reorder the algorithms of what we see online or potentially quasi-criminalize uh, speech that uh, is potentially in, in conflict with government agenda, such as Roman Babber suggesting that uh, lockdowns are harmful because their surgeries are delayed or cancer screenings are missed. That may, may become speech that uh, will, will be prohibited. And, and that is not an option in a free and democratic society. So I'm going to uh, repeal all the censorship legislation. I'm going to defend regulated professionals and their ability to speak. Uh, and most importantly, there is no free speech uh, without free and independent media. And that means that I'm going to defund the CBC. Um, that's, I'm going to do that before lunchtime. I'm going to end all bailouts and subsidies that the federal government is giving the media. And I'm going to limit the way that government is able to advertise in the new news media. We've seen unprecedented media buys by government on all platforms. That's essentially what's keeping the media afloat. And so how is media going to be holding the government accountable when uh, the government signs its paycheck? It's impossible. And finally, I'm going to deal with um, social media giants and through the Bureau of Competition, insist that they actually stick to their traditional role, uh, which is platform providers, not content providers and not filters of content. Uh, otherwise, we need to revisit the way that liability works. I am determined to preserve our speech online and on the media. The freedom of speech is the most precious right of them all. It's something that I lecture on um, as, a, as an occasional uh, lecture on constitutional and criminal law topics. Um, it's through our freedom of speech that we protect all other rights and all other Canadians. And I'm determined to preserve our freedom of speech uh, to preserve our democracy, because without democracy, we don't have anything. I'm also uh, determined to revive and restore Canadian opportunity. And I've been blessed with everything our country has to offer. Um, I'm, I'm an immigrant to Canada. I came here at age 15 and we didn't have a cent to our name. My first mattress was from the recycling bin across the street. But I've always had a job and I've always had this remarkable joy because I had Canadian opportunity because all you need to do to succeed in Canada is just two things. You've got to work hard and be nice to people. That's it. And if you just do those two things, then everything will be okay. But I feel that this Canadian opportunity is now being eroded and it's our responsibility to preserve it for future generations and of Canadians and, and for all Canadians. And so I propose that we do a couple of things. And most importantly, that we let people work. We deregulate these, these crazy, uh, onerous federal, uh, federal industries like telecom, aviation, and banking, and actually allow for healthy competition to help consumers to reduce prices, to increase customer service. If anything, uh, we learned from the Rogers outage a couple of weeks ago is that we have uh, disastrous federal uh, industries that I will look to unwind for the benefit of the consumer, invite more competition to let people work. I'm very much against universal basic income, which is potentially coming down the pipeline, and that's the wrong pipeline. Um, I, I think we don't want additional government dependency. We want um, Canadians to be less dependent on government. Uh, and of course, it's going to come with strings attached and it's going to discourage Canadians from working. We want to encourage them to work. And I'm also, I also fear with the universal basic income that uh, wages are going to rise drastically. And that means that the cost of living will rise drastically because you've got to entice workers to work. Canadians don't want universal basic income, we want to earn an income. Uh, the most important thing we can do in terms of letting Canadians work is to allow us to develop our natural resources. I think our natural resources are a blessing. I'm not going to let oil and gas be canceled. It's good for our strategic interests, our economic bottom line. It's the only way we're going to climb out of the fiscal hole that we're in. And uh, it's also good for the planet because Canadians can derive energy cleaner and safer than any other nation on earth. I'm running against socialism in Canada, which means I'm going to end supply management and allow farmers to produce as much milk and cheese and dairy as they wish. It's good for the consumer. I'm against cartels. Uh, same with agricultural products and, and uh, fertilizer. For the record, uh, I'm not going to be eating uh, any crickets. 
and we should encourage uh, Canadian farmers to farm instead of having a centralized agency like the uh, Dairy Council uh, telling us how much production we may have. That's that's not something that's expected of a, of a free economic regime. And I'm going to end equalization uh, because I'm against uh, encouraging dependency between provinces. Uh, we should encourage them to develop their natural resources. It's going to help our regional divides and it's going to uh, encourage our country to become the natural resources superpower that uh, I think we ought to be. I'm interested in privacy. I'm interested in children with autism. There's a lot of, of work to be done. I'd like to bring a different culture, uh, which uh, I've acquired in the private sector. I've practiced law for 12 years uh, before I was elected. Um, I, I think that we can heal almost everything that ails Canadians uh, with two things, and that's restoring our democracy and allowing us to um, develop our natural resources. I, I hope to win this leadership or do well in this leadership because we need to send a message to the Conservative Party of Canada with respect to the last two years. We need to tell them that um, we expect them to, to do right by Canadians at all times. We've got to shake up the Conservative Party because where have they been for the last two years? Why did they not stand up for Canadians against this remarkable overreach that we saw by way of COVID response uh, before the truckers came to town. And finally, I need to ensure, so, so I'll ensure that the Conservative Party always stands on principle, that we do what we believe is right and we say what we believe, even when it's unpopular and before the truckers come to town. And that the history regards uh, what transpired with a fair narrative, these tactics like segregation, censorship, uh, psychological manipulation, we cannot allow them to stand or to be justifiable down the road because then we'll never get our democracy back and we'll never fully go back to normal. But I insist that we get our democracy back and we go back to normal in full. That is why I'm in this race and that is why I ask for your vote on uh, first ballot. Thank you. Well, that, that, that was, uh, that was great, Roman. Uh, um, thank you. Thank you so much for that. And, uh, you know, you touched on, on the censorship and maybe we can, we can go into a little bit of that. Uh, it, the firearms community, we, uh, at, with the big giants, you know, Facebook and Instagram and YouTube, uh, we, we get censored. So I, I look forward to hearing more about that platform, uh, uh, with you on on how you would how you would go about it and make it fair for for all Canadians whether you like firearms or whether you don't like firearms and what what you would do with these uh, with these big giants Jordan um, we, uh, we we have so I'm in favor of all business I love small business medium business big business it's business and the people that work for these businesses that pay the bills not government but that doesn't mean that we should allow for what we now have being technological monopolies that have outgrown so much that they have effectively become the public square. And, and if Facebook or if Twitter are now the public square, then we ought to insist that they behave like the public square, especially if they get all sorts of liability protection from defamation, given that traditionally they were supposed to act as platforms. You and I can, can post to our heart's content as long as we're not breaking the criminal law. And we know what the law is. Do not incite violence. Do not demonize an identifiable group of people like the prime minister does. Short of that, we have the right to be wrong. What happened to, you know, disagreeing with one another? You have the right to your own opinion, but I'm going to, def I might disagree with your opinion, but I'm going to defend your right to say it. That's how tr traditionally Canadians viewed one another. And, and that's what we got to reinstate. So I think that the Bureau of Competition should now be having a look at whether these are monopolies beyond the scope of what they're meant to be. I think that we can probably enter into a voluntary agreement. I don't think we'll need litigation um, to, to restore the right of Canadians to free speech unencumbered online, irrespective of their views or politics, as long as they're not breaking criminal law. It's good for democracy and it's good for public policy. Absolutely. So, uh, also with censorship, uh, while we're while we're talking about that, when it when it comes to firearms policy, it, it seems like this Trudeau government has been censoring the firearms community. Um, you know, they they say that they've uh, uh, talked to all the stakeholders, and they have not reached out to the firearms community. So, if you were to move on and become prime minister, and it came time for uh, 
firearms policy, would you consider the Canada's National Firearms Association as well as the other orgs in, as a stakeholder and ask for their advice when, when producing the policy? Absolutely. How can you devise public policy without consulting stakeholders and, and without having the ability to understand the issues better? In fairness, I, as I mentioned, I, I come from a, a, a North Toronto riding. I have a, a, a community uh, that uh, suffers from gun violence, namely illegal gun violence. Um, none of the gun violence that's happening in, in North Toronto is, is committed by uh, law-abiding gun owners. But of course, many Canadians uh, are sometimes not familiar with these issues and, and conversation and education is better. And I'm actually grateful uh, to Charles and, and to some other folks that have given me a, a better understanding and perspective as to the issue. I want to delve into the issues, not shut stakeholders out. Thanks, Roman. Well, uh, you know what? If I could just jump in for one second, I just wanted to talk about the uh, the GTA and the whole um, the riding and or your riding and the Toronto riding, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we've heard you mention this before about uh, you know these people don't understand that. Of course, they're in the midst of all this you know armed criminal violence. Um, but I just want to let you know that most of the guns in Canada despite what the liberals tried to spin between the, you know, this urban and rural divide are within this region. So everything from Niagara Falls all the way up to Quebec City. So, you know, what we, uh, I know the conservatives have made this mistake in the past where, you know, they try to concede or not talk about guns in the area because they think that, you know, it's a, it's a non-issue or an, or, or an issue that won't win them any votes. But this is where the people that have guns are and they vote. So last time, uh, we lost pretty bad because, frankly, uh, there were some mistakes done on the conservative side, and there's really nothing to vote for at that point. So hopefully when you become prime minister, you won't make that mistake and you can actually, you know, give the people, the, the gun owners, the law abiding, responsible gun owners in the GTA, in this area where most of the guns are in Canada, something to vote for and usher the conservatives into victory. Charles, I have built a reputation to in the last couple of years and, in the, and prior to that, to say things that some Canadians perceive to be unpopular. I spoke out against lockdowns and mandates when there was no conversation allowed about that. Uh, and, and I'm not afraid to raise difficult issues and communicate difficult issues effectively. You know, uh, I actually think that uh, the radical left has overplayed its hand with COVID. And we're now able to say things that previously the politically correct cancel culture mob would not allow us to say. For instance, uh, I'm comfortable saying to you gentlemen that, you know, I don't believe that taxing Sally $10 at the gas pump is going to bring about change to the global climate. I don't believe that. I don't think anyone believes that anymore. So I'm not going to literally shoot Canadians in the foot. I'm not going to shoot our own foot to, I, instead I'm going to in, encourage the creation of our natural resources. And I think that same goes for all policy, and that includes gun policy. But to your point about elections, and, and I'm happy to talk about my gun policy, uh, what one of the colossal mistakes that Aaron O'Toole made, and in fact many other conservative politicians do, is that they run to the right during the leadership election, and then they pivot to the left during the general election. And what that ends up doing is it ends up alienating conservative voters, Right, conservative stakeholders or, or or folks that have legitimate issues start thinking that they cannot trust the leader. The left pounces on them and says that they're a flip flopper, and and then people really don't know where we stand. And and that is an unacceptable proposition. We can't afraid. We can't be afraid to be who we are. And even if our positions are unpopular or or maybe some Canadians will not agree with them, we have to. Uh, articulate them with confidence. I think that there's a lot to be said for clarity. Uh, you might not agree with me, but at the very least, you'll know where I stand. Okay. Now, uh, I want to jump in, uh, Roman, uh, with a couple uh, issues that are directly affecting firearms owners across Canada, the 2.2 plus uh, firearms owners across Canada. Uh, one of them is the order and council where the Liberal government banned 1,500 types of firearms and uh, two bills, uh, one that has been passed, Bill C-71 and uh, Bill C-21, which is uh, past second reading. I just wonder if, uh, what, what is your uh, 
what is your position? Uh, we'll start with the order in council. Uh, what is your position on uh, on the order of council? I'll repeal it. Speaking generally, gun violence will not be stopped by virtue signaling, and and with almost no exceptions, law-abiding citizens do not commit gun crimes. Almost all gun crimes are committed with illegal guns, and so liberal gun legislation or, or regulations will not do anything to stop or deter gun crime. Almost all illegal guns uh, are smuggled to Canada through the U.S. border. And so what I propose that uh, we respect law-abiding gun owners, uh, repeal the proposed liberal legislation and, and the past regulation, and instead we should ensure that the Canada Border Services Agency, or whatever it is called now, that it has the necessary staff, tools, and training to prevent the flow of illegal guns across the border. We have a disaster at the border. It's not just guns. It's also fentanyl, fentanyl that is killing so many Canadians. Uh, let's fix the culture, the incompetence, and, and the lack of resources in the Canada Border Agency to stop the flow of illegal guns. That's where I want to go uh, to, to stop criminals from having illegal guns rather than uh, targeting law-abiding Canadians. Yeah, I, I'm glad. I'm glad you. I'm glad you said that. And you also touched on uh, the issues with the other two bills involved. More regulation uh, to law-abiding gun owners isn't going to change anything. I think uh, you're on the right track, going after uh, where the where the where the real problem is: uh, the smuggled guns, the gangs. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you touched on that. Uh, do you guys have any more questions for Roman? Uh, so, so Roman. Um, so. Uh, we, we've now seen that this government has reduced mandatory minimums for some of these crimes. Some, some of these include firearms. Uh, would, would, if you were to form government, would you reinstate mandatory minimums and put, put those away th that are committing these crimes instead of going after law-abiding citizens for paperless crimes, uh, such as, you know, if we forget to uh, take our firearms license, that little plastic card uh, to the range with us, we could be in some serious trouble. Whereas, you know, like if you were driving downtown and you forgot your driver's license and cop pulls you over and you're, and you're seeing, and, you know, he, he talks with you, you're usually given about 24 hours or you're given a small fine. You don't go to jail. Uh, usually you can, you can produce, or they'll call in and they'll, they'll verify who you are and, and it has on record that they, that they are, you are a licensed driver driver. So uh, certain things like that, I think we do need fixed in the firearms act. Uh, is that something that you'd be willing to uh, move forward with? Absolutely. Just very quickly to Rick's point, uh, 30 years of ineffective liberal firearms legislation proved that law-abiding gun owners aren't responsible for violent crime. They never have been. But to your point, Jordan, so absolutely. And and I, in fact, I will ask a very comprehensive for a very comprehensive review of our criminal code and and the way that we approach uh, crime and punishment. So when I was a young law student, I, I my first gig while I was a student was at Legal Aid. And it's where I, I picked up a lot of my humanity and, and compassion for people. And I can tell you, most of the stuff on, on the petty level uh, in our country is driven by mental health and addiction. We are spending remarkable resources, police resources, court resources uh, on, on enforcement that does not deter or heal addiction, which is a catastrophe. Uh, in, instead, uh, what we're not doing is we're not focusing on major gun crime. We're not focusing on gangs. We're not, we don't have a, a general RICO provision where we can try and, and wind up corrupt enterprise. And, and certainly, we have failed to address the striking down of Harper's uh, minimum uh, sentencing gun legislation by the Supreme Court. What I will look to do is I will look to uh, pass sentencing legislation targeting uh, illegal gun crime and illegal, and, and illegal gun possession and ownership to the maximum extent permissible by the framework outlined by the Supreme Court. That's where we ought to go on day one. Uh, but also, I, I think we need a modern justice system that addresses the realities of the day. I have no interest in spending prosecutorial resources on an offense such as you just described, 
where you don't have an intent to offend. You you do not have an intent not to carry your little plastic gun license. Um, that it, and and I would ask uh, that my attorney general uh, come up with a policy that, that tells the justice system and and law enforcement throughout the country to be reasonable and smart enough. We have so many challenges that are affecting us right now. We have a fentanyl crisis. We have a human trafficking crisis. Not to mention that we have uh, a rule of law system that effectively left Parliament Hill. So I, I would ask that we exercise sensibility in the way we, we approach law enforcement. And, and that goes for legal, uh, for legal gun owners, for Canadians that are not responsible for gun crime, but are, are suffering from uh, these, this liberal regime. Perfect. So, uh, uh, Charles, you, you wanted to touch on something? Yeah, actually, you know what? That, that was great, Roman. Um, and you touched on some of the points that I, uh, I want to talk about, and that was a great segue. So, as you said, we, we've got, you know, this abysmal history of failed public policy that's been going on for decades. And it's been brought upon us not only by these revisionist liberals, but also misguided conservatives. So we have layer upon layer of legislation, gun control, that has no effect on crime control, but what it has an effect on are, are innocent people, okay? So we have, you know, 2.2 million people out there that are all subject to the discriminatory legal process that's in place here, but what's driving that is the, is the ongoing demonization, systemic demonization by the government, right, to look at us as some kind of uh, public safety issue because we happen to own a tool that is exactly what you know some of the uh, the criminals out there use conflating the two together is disingenuous and it's wrong okay so you've talked about what you're going to do um, you know with the things that have been recently passed and also about what you want to do in the future but we have the weight of injustice on us from the past there's all this legislation that is treating us with prejudice um, it's maligned us. We don't deserve it. We're not the problem. We're looking for justice. Um, for instance, uh, you know, the latest uh, C-21, they're resurrecting slow motion civil disarmament again through grandfathering. There's lots of people out there that, that in all good conscience, you know, bought their firearms legally, went through the process, and then the government arbitrarily banned them. And now they're worthless and they're sitting in their safes and they can't use them. So I, I, I'd like you to speak to that situation where um, we have people out there, like I do, like we all do now, um, we have private property sitting in our saves. I, I, I can't use them, right? And I can't equate them to my heirs when I die. Um, can, you, can you talk to the estate part of this? Like with all those people out there, have all this private property pent up, millions and millions of dollars, you know, that, are, that have been stored now, what would you do in that regard to give these people justice and restore their private property rights? Charles, a couple of things I want to address there. First of all, um, I've always felt uh, regret and almost a sense of dissatisfaction that, that Canada's constitution, which I love very much and, and lecture on occasionally, does not protect economic and property rights um, like in other places in the world south of the border. Uh, Margaret Thatcher said uh, property rights are a part and parcel of, of our democracy. And, and that goes to, to two things specifically here that concern me very much. One is retroactivity. You have certainty in law. You have private property. And all of a sudden, the government comes and says, what you thought was completely lawful one day is now no longer lawful. It, it doesn't just devalue your property or eliminate your property. It fundamentally cuts a certainty of law, a, a rule of law principle that uh, a lawful law abiding Canadian may one day, by virtue of a stroke of a pen, without doing anything, become a sought after criminal. That is contrary to the principles of the rule of law and democracy. I find that very, very offensive. The second element in, in what you talk about is how the new legislature specifically uh, and the regulation to some extent are creating what I would deem to be an expropriation regime where government can effectively say now 
by virtue of legislation, I can expropriate your personal property. And that is a very, very dangerous and slippery slope. We have thought about, we're a common law jurisdiction, we thought about expropriation for almost eight or nine centuries because it's such a, a, a delicate thing to do for the government to come and to effectively want to take your own property. And the problem with that is the slippery slope because what, what has been deemed to be unlawful less spring and, and now we're moving forward and, and we're moving further and further and we're setting a very, very bad precedent for expropriation. And I'll end, I'll end this by going to the original point that you made, which is that gun owners are being demonized. The liberals are experts at demonizing people. It could be people that think that we should not be locking down people or, or people that believe that we should not force others to make medical decisions against their will, right? Or they could be demonizing folks that say, we think that, that the global energy needs are just going to increase and not decrease. And so we should develop natural resources responsibly. We can strike the right balance. Those Canadians are being demonized as well as someone who hate the planet. This is a classic liberal playbook. Why does the radical left do that? Because the more demonizing you do, the more division you have, the less friends and advocates you have on your side. You don't want to be associating with someone who, for instance, the liberals have successfully called a racist, which is what they go to when they have nothing. And, and that's what they do. That's how they divide Canadians. And, and the theme, one of the themes of my campaign, other than just democracy and opportunity, is that Charles, we should not be afraid. We, whether it comes to natural resources or democracy or lawful property ownership, we're on the right side of history and we need to unite as Canadians and certainly as conservatives, even if we have some minor policy disagreements, we have to vote out this liberal government so we can preserve the inherent nature of our democracy. I have never wanted to win an election as much as I want to win the next election. Because I have to, because I can't imagine how we're going to continue living in our country if Trudeau is back or, God forbid, Christia Freeland, even worse. So uh, let's, let's have courage to stand up for one another. There are many interest holders and many Canadians that are being demonized just like gun owners. And that means we have to stick up for gun owners as well. Thanks, Roman. Uh, yeah, you, you called it there. The, that's the Liberals' go-to, discrimination and firearms. That's always, uh, that's always where they spin it to. You know what? We find a lot that's because they've got nothing else to go on. And uh, you know, that's why our position is, uh, is so strong with 2.2-plus uh, million gun owners across Canada. They're, you know, they're demonizing us, and we don't appreciate it. Thanks, uh, thanks for those points. Absolutely. We're, we're the scapegoats. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, okay. So, uh, Roman, uh, now when when coming up with new policy, and, and I keep seeing this a lot um, in our emails and and on our uh, from comments that we get through our social media. Uh, would you say it's fair that somebody that is um, doing this leg like doing firearms legislation should go through the PAL course and have a non restricted restricted firearms license to to see exactly what firearms owners go through? Uh, would you like to comment on that? You know, first of all, education is always good. And I, I actually have to give Charles uh, a compliment here. Uh, him and I had a, a number of discussions and, and I learned quite, quite a bit and, um, and, and look forward to learning more. Um, but, but generally speaking, I'm a, I'm a technician. I like to delve into, uh, files and issues and, um, after this leadership is over, uh, you guys are welcome to this table that I'm seated at right now, and and we'll we'll order some some food, and I'll pull out my laptop, and I'm prepared to understand the issue inside out in order to get to the same destination, which is uh, let people breathe, stop demonizing law-abiding Canadians, and figure out a way how to come down on uh, illegal crime and, and illegal guns. And, and so uh, walking a mile in your shoes, is certainly something that I'm, I'm open to doing. Um, you asked me before the interview if I've ever been to a range. Uh, I've been to a range probably twice in my life. Um, a good friend of mine took me to a range in Aurora maybe a decade ago. I had a lot of fun that day. I'm 
I'm content, but uh, I ask your members and, and I ask you gentlemen, um, we have a, a monumental and a very important task ahead of us right now. We have to unite as a party and, and defeat the Justin Trudeau liberals. And uh, I think we, we're gonna have immediate relief on all fronts as soon as, uh, as, soon as we're, we're successful in that. Great. Okay, so uh, I guess uh, I guess we'll just do a, a final a final uh, thought and uh, maybe tell our audience uh, if they want more information, give them your website and give your your final pitch to the firearms community, and and we'll we'll wrap it up from there. Absolutely. So uh, one of the things that I bring to the table, uh, aside from courage to take on the radical left and and the difficult issues of the day, uh, is I'm a big fan of the rule of law. And, and maybe that is something that uh, gun owners would like, is, is that we have certainty in law, we don't expropriate property, we, it's sensible uh, legislation that uh, actually addresses uh, the risk and, and does not demonize uh, Canadians. And beyond that, I'll say that, look, um, I have had um, the, the honor and the blessing to stand up for Canadians for the last couple of years, even when it was unpopular. And I will continue to do so, no, no matter how tough it gets. Uh, I've been blessed in my life and, and my, my faith and um, my God-given skills will, will help me continue to work for Canadians. And so I ask that you consider ranking me first. It's a ranked ballot. Um, you can rank me first and then a more popular candidate. That is how I will get your vote, that our message of democracy and law and order is heard loud and clear throughout our party. And I'd be very honored uh, to lead our party and our country. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Thanks, Roman. So I guess we'll wrap it up. Uh, on behalf of Canada's National Farms Association, I'd like to thank you to, for coming out to this, uh, to this NFA talk. We sure appreciate it. We sure uh, like to hear your uh, perspective and standpoint on a lot of issues. It was very enlightening and very encouraging. Again, on behalf of Canada's National Firearms Association, thank you, Roman. Thank you, Rick. All right. And uh, thank you, everybody that's tuning in. And uh, until next time, this is NFA Talk. Thanks for listening to this episode of NFA Talk. Like and follow the NFA on social media and sign up to become a member.